Chapter 39 Reichstag Revolution Let justice be done, though the heavens fall. The final words of Inez's speech seem to ring through all of human territory. On every colony and space station, including the ones occupied by the GDF, the populace rose up. Protesters swarmed against government offices, demanding answers, accountability, and a change in leadership. On Terra Nova, GDF occupation forces were alarmed to see a huge mob of angry humans march past their own positions. After protesting and yelling for a few minutes, nearly 400 people surged forward and broke into a nondescript compound of buildings. Within minutes, the local branch of the internal security office was being stormed. Similar scenes played out all across human territory as furious citizens turned against their own spy agency. ISO offices and safe houses were broken into and looted by civilians while dumbfounded GDF soldiers looked on. At Alpha Centauri, Sirius, Procyon, and Tau Ceti, ISO field agents were dragged into the streets and beaten by the crowd. Then, things got even more violent. At the ISO black site in Yutaka Yamamoto University, a room was found that contained 40 alien children. They were abducted from their home worlds by the progeny and then handed over for the Prometheus Project. One of the abductees told their rescuers that hundreds of alien children were already dead. GDF soldiers tried to intervene, but it was too late. That was when the killing began. All over human territory, ISO operatives were lynched on sight, and vigilantes hunted down the last remaining members of the cult of Jericho. What few acolytes and sorceresses remained quickly fled into hiding. Those who were caught met far more gruesome fates than the ISO agents. News of the abductions and murders began to spread. Humans in the occupied territories appealed to the GDF for help, repeating rumors and tall tales about the horrible crimes of their own spy agency and religious leaders. Without waiting for orders, GDF soldiers joined the mob. They were desperate to capture and detain ISO agents, who would be much easier to interrogate if they were not hanging by their necks from streetlights. November 28th, 2086. Berlin, Germany. The armada of the Galactic Defense Force could be seen from the city streets, even in the middle of the day. Tens of thousands of human protesters gathered in the Tiergarten and Brandenburg Gate could see it above. Just beyond the Brandenburg Gate, the headquarters of the ISO was burning as brightly as the sun. Just like its many field offices, the building was stormed by a mob of civilians. ISO employees were trampled, beaten, and a few were even thrown out of windows. Someone in the crowd found a stack of crucial documents gathered by human spies, and they set it on fire. The inferno quickly spread and consumed the entire building, causing the protesters to flee. It was against this backdrop that Blake Robinson and his entourage arrived. German Polizei flooded out of the Reichstag building, demanding protesters clear out of the Platz der Republik. After half an hour of pushing, shoving, and yelling, the flat, grassy area was clear of people. With a loud roar, two spacecraft glided down to the surface. A Partogan Ambassador Corvette and a human Ambassador Corvette. These diplomatic ships were unarmed and decorated with elaborate symbols and emblems. They also carried a wide array of antenna and lights for communication. Under normal circumstances, Ambassador Corvettes were used to make first contact with new alien races. Both vessels landed smoothly on the grass and lowered their boarding ramps. The watching crowd was restless and their own chatter drowned out the voices of anyone on the grass. A tall, dragon-like alien stepped down from the Partogan Corvette and began to speak loudly 
as though announcing someone's arrival. Unfortunately, the combined noise of the protesters and starship engines drowned out his voice. A moment later, the Galactic Custodian set foot on the Tear Garden. Partogan Queen Marka did not acknowledge the protesters. The Polizei formed a cordon around the landing area, ensuring none of the crowd approached the starships. Queen Marka and her advisor looked up at the human starship as two people descended the ramp. Blake Robinson and Chihiro Tachibana shook hands with the Galactic Custodian before they turned to acknowledge the crowd. Once they saw Blake, the protesters erupted into cheers and applause. A rallying cry rose up from the gathered people. Justice! 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 Blake, Chihiro, Queen Marka, the advisor, and an entourage of diplomats started walking toward the Reichstag. As the group drew closer to the UN capital, the nature of the crowd's chanting started to change. Calls of support for Blake and pleas for justice gave way to anti-ISO mantras and messages of hate directed at one particular man who was standing at the top of the grand staircase. UN Secretary General Pascal Etienne looked very haggard, as though he had not slept for most of the night. His shirt and vest were unkempt, his hair uncombed. Two high-ranking members of the United Nations flanked him on either side. Ruslan Shmihal, the president of the Security Council, and Varuna Das, a Bengali woman who served as president of the General Assembly. A few members of the crowd managed to guess what was about to happen, and they called on their fellow protesters to hush and be quiet. But the transfer of power happened so quickly that only a few people in the front of the crowd actually heard it. General Assembly President Daz shook hands with Blake, and then she spoke. Your Excellency, by Resolution 15-1 of the 25th of November 2086, the General Assembly has appointed you Secretary General of the United Nations of Earth for a term of office beginning on 1st of January 2087 and ending on 31st December 2091. I will now ask you to take the oath of office. President Das held out a copy of the 2036 UN Charter. It was a heavy book bound in blue fabric. Blake placed his left hand on the book and raised his right hand. Please repeat after me said President Das. Then she administered the oath of office. I, Blake Alexander Robinson, solemnly swear to exercise in all loyalty, discretion, and conscience the functions entrusted to me as Secretary General of the United Nations of Earth, to discharge these functions and regulate my conduct with the interest of the United Nations only in view, and not to seek or accept instructions in regard to the performance of my duties from any government or other authority external to the organization. There was no time to celebrate. Secretary General Blake Robinson entered the Reichstag, while Pascal Etienne, guided by Marcus Robinson, followed behind. Custodian Marka and Chihiro brought up the rear. The group had a plan and they were acting on it. In his final days as Secretary General, Pascal Etienne had contacted the GDF directly and brokered a deal with custodian Marka. Pascal offered to immediately step aside for Blake Robinson, and in turn, the GDF would cease all hostilities with the UN. There would be peace. As the group turned the corner, Blake spoke. Marcus, where is the Supreme Commander of the UN military? She's right here. Marcus pointed at an office door just down the hall. She was just sworn in a few days ago. It took forever to get France to drop their veto against her. A Caucasian woman stuck her head out of the office to see who was talking. Her brown hair was tied up in a tight bun and she wore a military dress uniform, adorned with several patches that identified her as a member of XCOM. When she spotted Blake, the woman snapped to attention and said, Greetings, sir. 
My name is Sidney Buclair, Air Marshal of the Royal Australian Air Force and recently appointed Supreme Commander of Afune. I'm still working on sec... Uh, uh, I mean, your predecessor's orders, sir. Just before you were sworn in, I told Buclair to order all UN military forces to cease hostilities and stand down, Etienne explained. It was part of the deal I made with Custodian Marka. The Galactic Custodian narrowed her eyes at Marshal Buclair for a moment before speaking to Blake. I sent similar orders to my own forces, she said. I hope, Your Excellency, that you will honor the ceasefire your predecessor established. I have every intention of doing that, Blake said. Marshal Buclair, carry on and get the job done. Yes, sir, she replied, already vanishing inside of her office. The group moved upstairs to the Secretary General's office. Here they parted ways with Pascal Etienne. The former UN leader said he needed to meet with a few members of the Secretariat. As soon as Etienne was gone, the remaining members of the group piled inside of Secretary General's office and closed the door. Was that her? Blake said. The Air Marshal? His son, Marcus, nodded. She's mentioned five or six times in the Ulysses file, Marcus said. Director Freeman always called her reliable, too, so that must count for something. All right, Dad, here we go. Biometric data in the Reichstag computer should have been updated by now, so your thumbprint should be able to open any drawer or safe in this office. Fan out, everyone. We've got to find the Ulysses file. The group fanned out and quickly turned the Secretary General's office upside down. They were doing much the same thing as the people who stormed the ISO offices around the world. Blake quickly skimmed over classified documents before placing them in sealed envelopes. Ulysses, Ulysses, Blake murmured. Where the hell is it? I've got it! Chihiro cried out all of a sudden. The Ulysses Initiative, authorized by Pascal Etienne, deemed classified on February 11th, 2083. Everyone gathered around her. Blake Marcus and the dragon-like advisor quickly pulled the file apart, searching for the most crucial pages. They've moved the hyperspace core, the advisor declared. Etienne was going to have it sent off world. Psionic weapons, alien children, body armor, ballistic ammunition, reactive armor, starship fuel, military-grade drones and androids, nano med kits, 3D printers, and fabricators. Blake read aloud. Freeman and her allies have stockpiled everything they need to create a psionic army. Create an army and move it, Chihiro said. She's planning to relocate her entire operation to Deneb 2B. Those profit class command cruisers have the hangar bays and shuttlecraft required to transport her army. So this is her game, Queen Marcus said. Akira is going to create her own highly mobile military, one that's under her own personal control. Then she'll hide out in Deneb to gather strength. When she's ready, Akira will come back and reconquer Earth, Blake finished, and rule as a psionic overlord. Marcus let out a gasp of alarm, then held up a folder for everyone to see. It was empty. The launch codes! Marcus said. She took the launch codes for the Prophet class cruisers. They're all gone. Blake moved quickly to the door and yelled out for the master at arms. A UN soldier quickly raced to the Secretary General's office. Find Marshal Buclair and arrest her, Blake ordered. And you, Marka, you must order the GDF to blockade Florida at once. Nothing gets out of Canaveral. December 1st. 2086. Cape Canaveral, Florida. Sophie Murphy, the youngest member of the Robinson family, looked up at the sky and gulped. She had never seen a juggernaut before, and the view of one descending toward her was the stuff of nightmares. The Partogan flagship Mahuika painted with the colors and liveries of the Galactic Defense Force, was settling into position almost directly above the Kennedy Space Center. From here, the Mahuika looked like a gigantic wing. 
She was almost 15 kilometers wide from wingtip to wingtip and a further 8 kilometers in height. The gargantuan warship hovered about 50 kilometers above Cape Canaveral, ready to impede any attempted escape. Still no sign of Director Freeman, said a voice to Sophie's left. It was Klaus Eberhardt, the commander of XCOM. He was looking over the base's security in Scarlet's absence. She should have been back by now, Sophie said. The Vengeance said they picked her up near Ceres. Now they'll have to run a blockade to get back here, Commander Eberhardt replied. We must be patient. December 3rd, 20. 86. Elberton, Georgia. Rocking her wings unsteadily, the JSDF Archangel glided through the Earth's atmosphere. Below her, a mixed force of GDF and contingency starships carried out their own landings. All over Earth, the forces of the Galactic Council were being allowed to land. Word about the end of the war was spreading just as quickly as the news of Etienne's fall from power. While most humans were cautious and gave the GDF a lukewarm reception, there were some cities where the GDF was being greeted and celebrated as a liberating force. Elberton was one such town. The Archangel aimed for a rally point just outside of the town in the countryside. Gripping the control column tightly, Randall and Chris guided the space plane onto a grassy runway, coming to a stop in between a Titani frigate and a Skildari corvette. GDF crews helped Himawari disconnect from the ship before everyone disembarked. That Battlemaster is pretty beat up, one of the crewmen said. You folks want a new ship? Not on your life, Amako said. We've been through a lot with the Angel. We're going all the way to the end with her. Of course, Amako said this before he saw the extensive damage done to the Archangel's left-hand wing. It was a miracle they were able to land without shearing it off. Irabek clicked her beak loudly, and within seconds, a Batera warform answered her summons. Unlike the bipedal robots seen on Spherus Magna, the dedicated combat units of the contingency-controlled Batera were huge, armored machines of war. Each warform stood about nine feet tall and had a rounded exoskeleton reminiscent of a beetle shell. Like their smaller, non-combat variants, these machines walked on two legs and had two arms. The Batera warforms carried a large, rounded shield in each hand. Made from some kind of metal, the shields had niches and sliding doors that contained some secret technology. Irabic parted ways from Himawari's group here. She went off to commune with the Batera. Meanwhile, Himawari, Amako, Chris, and Randall walked to the far end of the field where someone was waiting for them. That's it! Amako pointed towards a group of four large stones. That's the rally point! The rally point was an old monument, constructed in the days of the old world. Known as the Georgia Guide Stones, the four slabs of granite were engraved with ten instructions that detailed how to rebuild society after an apocalyptic event. 1. Maintain humanity under 500 million in perpetual balance with nature. 2. Guide reproduction wisely, improving fitness and diversity. 3. Unite humanity with a new living language. 4. Rule passion, faith, tradition, and all things with tempered reason. 5. Protect people and nations with fair laws and just courts. 6. Let all nations rule internally, resolving external disputes in a world court. 7. Avoid petty laws and useless officials. 8. Balance personal rights 
with social duties. Nine, prize truth, beauty, love, seeking harmony with the infinite. Ten, be not a cancer on the earth. Leave room for nature. Leave room for nature. Standing around the guidestones, the Stormbreakers were debating whether or not the monument succeeded in its mission. Well, the first stone says humanity's population needs to stay low, Corder was saying. How many of you are there now? <laughs> There's about 5 billion of us here on Earth, plus another 20 million living on the colonies, Varian replied. Guess we kinda screwed that one up. Avoid petty laws, Kingi read aloud. Then he laughed. <laughs> yeah, you humans screwed that one up all right. Maui pointed to the second guidestone. This one says, guide reproduction wisely. That sounds a lot like something the old Advent regime would say. They were all about eugenics and gene therapy. Nainu only had eyes for the final tablet, where the ninth and tenth rules could be found. These rules about living harmoniously with the planet, Nainu commented, they are very similar to the environmentalist creed we have on Kelta. Perhaps in one of the alternate timelines, the humans came to worship their homeworld just as my people do. Nainu did not have much time to think about this because it was in this moment that Himawari and her crew caught up to the Stormbreakers. Varian cried and pulled her, or his, mother into a tight hug. Well, how about that? It's a small galaxy, isn't it? Randall said, patting his former stepchild on the back. You look like you've seen more action than us. Corder narrowed her eyes at Randall. I know who you are, she said. Yet another of Himawari's ex-husbands. And you are... Oh, my... Randall Murphy did not respond. He was looking around anxiously. He caught Himawari by the arm. She twitched uncomfortably at the sudden touch from her ex-husband, but she paid attention as Randall quickly spoke to her in sign language. I need to go for a little while. I have not heard from our daughter since we left Earth. Himawari's eyes widened. Last I heard, Sophie was working for the Etienne government, Himawari replied. I think you should try talking to my brother Marcus. He will point you towards our daughter. Good idea, thank you, Randall replied, before he turned and ran away toward a nearby starship. He grabbed a Partogan soldier and demanded access to their hyperwave relay. The Partogan nodded and led Randall away. Meanwhile, the other Stormbreakers had spotted Chris Wright. The history dude, here in the flesh! Maui said, what are you doing here? I never would have taken you for a man of action. I'm not, Chris replied. But when things get rough, staying near the Robinson family is a good way to keep your head attached, you know? So what happens now? Himawari asked. She spoke in sign language while her child interpreted for the group. Well, I think that's obvious, Kingi said. We all saw that message Inez put out, right? We've got to start heading for Orlando, immediately. Everyone agreed. Varian pointed a thumb over his, or her, shoulder. We can just follow the Americans, Varian said. They've been helping GDF forces make the trip to Florida ever since the landing started. They're cooperating? Just like that, Amako said, confused. We got kinda lucky, Varian said. The Columbus regime is the successor to the American government that cooperated with XCOM during the last war. They've negotiated some kind of deal with Blake Robinson. The Americans help the GDF and, in return, they get to rejoin the UN as a full member. Which means all of the other militant groups in America, <laughs> even the other successor governments? Yeah, they're all screwed. Orlando. Florida, December 7th, 2086. Sir, I would feel much better about this if you had a bodyguard. Out of the question, no. Sir, 
I feel the need to remind you that Grey Phoenix does have an established history of run-ins with the government. I'm well aware I was there when those run-ins started half a century ago. Sir, I still want to position some space rangers if I see one soldier on the ground or a drone over my head. I'll see to it that you spend the rest of your days working moisture farms on a desert planet. Yes, sir. Unarmed and unescorted, UN Secretary General Blake Robinson stepped out of his car and walked toward the Gray Phoenix base. Two mutons, who were guarding the gate, recognized him on sight and opened it for him. Inez and her sister Cassandra were sitting on top of the Kakama's conning tower, almost 100 feet above the rest of Orlando. It was a beautiful winter morning, and there was nothing to do. Tens of thousands of people were still answering the desperate message Inez broadcasted into the galaxy days earlier. Looking out onto the horizon, Inez could see dozens of GDF starships coming into land at the Orlando spaceport. A handful of vessels she did not recognize were also landing there. It seemed as though, for the second time in history, the entire galaxy was traveling to Earth, answering a call for help and setting the stage for the final battle in some epic story. Since they had time to kill, Inez was getting back into one of her old habits. As she sat on top of the ancient starship, Inez strummed her guitar. It was not the same instrument she once played on the streets of Detroit that was long gone. This was a parlor guitar purchased from the flea market in downtown Orlando. Parlor guitars were small and easy to carry, which made them perfect for people of small stature such as Cassandra. As Inez strummed her instrument and ran her fingers along the fretboard, Cassandra mimicked her sister, plucking away at her own guitar, a copy of the one belonging to Inez. Today, Inez was playing a down-tempo adagio. It sounded very mournful and tragic. Perhaps it was because she was filled with dread about the upcoming assault on Cape Canaveral. She knew it had to be done. The lives of 200 abductees were at stake. But Inez also knew about the ill-fated assault led by Lawrence Ridge back in July. No matter which way she looked at this, Inez was asking people to risk their lives to save alien children. It was a tall order. Cassandra watched her older sister, fascinated. Inez was starting to lose herself in the music again. Inez rested the guitar on her crossed legs and stared into the distance, not seeming to notice the hustle and bustle of starships or the soldiers down below. The sound of a hatch opening nearby escaped her until... Adagio for strings... Samuel Barber, circa 1936, said a voice behind her. Where did you learn such an old tune? Lawrence Ridge, Inez replied absentmindedly, not looking around. He taught me to play. Cassandra looked around and let out a sharp gasp, which caused Inez to stop playing and turn to face the new arrival. All of the color drained from her face. UN Secretary General Blake Robinson was casually leaning against one of the old sensor antennas, peering down at the two girls. He was holding onto the antenna with one hand and holding an ornate golden cane with the other. Forgive me for not coming down there to join you, Secretary General Robinson said. I'm not as limber as I once was, and the days I spent fighting at the top and bottom of the world have not been kind to me as time goes on. Inez sprang to her feet and raised her hand in salute. She was, after all, still a member of both the ISO and UN Armed Forces. Blake waved a hand and gave her a warm smile. 
No need for all that formality. It just gets in the way, he said. Though I take it you must know who I am already. That's good. I'm honored, sir, Inez said, her voice shaking. I should be honored, Blake replied. It's been half a century since I met someone like you. Inez faltered. Oh, you mean how I'm, you know, her daughter? Inez looked down in shame. Blake tapped his wife's cane on the metal hull. No, 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 he said. I mean a person of conscious mind and of great consequence. It is normal for people to change sides in war. I've seen it happen. One of my closest friends came to me from the enemy. Inez felt Cassandra take hold of her hand and squeeze tightly. What I learned from your story, Inez Espinosa, is that you slowly awakened to a great wrong and injustice. You took action to make things right and motivated others to join you in that mission. I wouldn't say it like that, Inez said. I made a promise to Cassandra. I told her I'd go back and help those kids. Blake leaned in towards her. And you've kept your word in the most definitive of ways, Blake said. You've not only brought the galaxy to Akira Robinson's doorstep, you may as well be the first person to truly corner her in all of history. That is no small feat. You brought the Galactic Defense Force, the Columbus Americans, the Stormbreakers, and so many more new allies together for a noble cause, to set Akira's victims free and bring her to justice. Inez finally found the will to look Blake in the eyes. And what happens when we get to her? When we finally fight my mom? Blake reached out and put a hand on Inez's shoulder. You'll just need to remember one important thing, he said. You are not alone. Your friends and allies will be the key to fighting the paradox. You don't have to face her alone just because she's your mother. Blake let go of Inez, straightened up, and pointed to the north. You have reinforcements coming, he said. A combined force of American and UN soldiers are on their way to join up with the GDF. Then you will have a sufficient force to break into Canaveral and save those children. Just wait until the Stormbreakers arrive. Then you'll be ready. Cassandra ran towards the Secretary General and grabbed the front of his coat. Please, Cassandra cried out. When can we go? When can we save them? Blake gently patted her head. I promise the rescue will happen before the new year, Blake replied. For security reasons, I can't give you an exact date yet, but... He raised a finger to his lips and whispered. You should go to bed early on the 25th. I hear the day after Christmas will be a busy one. Inez could feel, through the telepathic link, Cassandra's spirits being lifted. The not-so-little girl hugged Blake and helped him step through the hatchway and back onto the ship. But before he departed completely, Blake withdrew an object from his coat a large wooden box that had a gold emblem stamped onto its lid. He beckoned Inez to draw near. By the way, Miss Espinosa, there's something you should know. I am the one who set up the new Stormbreakers. I handpicked each member of the team. I intended from the very beginning for you to be the seventh member of the team. And I'm so sorry you never got the chance to be with Varian and the others. I still stand by my belief that you would have been an incredible Stormbreaker. But now I can at least start to make this right. How are you going to do that? Inez asked. Haven't you figured it out yet? Blake said. Our connection. Inez and Cassandra shook their heads in unison. Akira Robinson was, 
in some distant and long forgotten alternate timeline, my daughter. An intrinsic connection exists between the Espinosa and Robinson families. I would like to keep you and your sister close after all this is over, Blake said. Close? Cassandra repeated. How close? Inez added, raising her eyebrow. Well, if you were to show up in Berlin, looking to join me and my family, you will be welcome. Please take this as proof of my word. Blake held out the wooden box. It is a gift from my wife, Chihiro Tachibana. She gives it to you with her blessing and prays it will serve you as well as it did her. And then Blake was gone. Inez and Cassandra were left with the wooden box. Inez took another look and realized she recognized the golden seal on the lid. It was the emblem of the chrysanthemum, the official symbol of the Japanese imperial family. Slowly, Inez opened the box and peered inside. Wrapped carefully in a white cloth, she found an ancient-looking pistol that looked as though it belonged in a bygone age. Inez recognized the oversized hammer and ramrod assembly along the barrel at once. This was one of the famous weapons used by the original Stormbreakers, one that Shahiro Tachibana carried into battle during both the Battle for Earth and the war in heaven. It was the Shadow Keeper.